Good evening. Good evening. Good to be with you this evening. Good to be back at Dawson Baptist Church. I, I count it a privilege anytime I get to be here. It's been a while since I've been here, and uh, I want to I want to thank the, uh, the the program committee for uh, having me on here and for allowing me to come and preach, uh, especially the uh, evangelistic message. I like anytime I get to preach, but I especially like preaching evangelistic messages. Uh, uh, something wrong with a preacher that doesn't like preaching that Jesus still saves. Amen. And uh, I, I look forward to that. I look forward to being here. Uh, I count it a privilege uh, to be with you all this evening, but if I can be just a smidge biased, I, I consider, consider it a special privilege anytime I get to be in the house of the Lord with Sally Ashley. Amen. And, uh, I love that dear lady. She's ordering cat guts, but I love her. And, uh, I, I count it a special privilege any time I get to go to church with her. Uh, it's good to see all my brothers and sisters in Christ. It's good to see uh, everyone here. And uh, I'm going to get right into it this evening. If you would, open your Bibles, if you have them with you, uh, to the last chapter of your Bible, Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22 this evening. I want to read just a few verses to get us started this evening uh, before I give you what I trust the Lord would have me to preach. Um, I, I, I have preached this message once at Rosedale and to all the folks that are here from Rosedale. Um, i got to say, it doesn't bother me so much for folks to have heard something that I've preached before, but it bothers me to know that they've heard me preach it, but they don't remember anything about the message. <laughs> uh, so... Hey, it's all right if if, uh, if you're from Rosedale and you've heard me preach this once before. Um, you just act like you've never heard it before. Uh, but uh, there's a phrase that I want to point out this evening and hopefully preach on. Uh, for the sake of time, I will, I will preach every time this phrase is mentioned. Uh, but just for your own edification, the phrase that we're going to read this evening uh, is found six times in the book of the Revelation. Uh, twice it is found in chapter 2. It is found once in chapter 3, and then it is found three times here in chapter 22. And the Lord Jesus is telling the Apostle John what to write. And if you look in your Bibles at Revelation chapter 22, I'll begin reading in verse 1. The Bible says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads, and there shall be no night there. And they need no candle, neither light of the sun, <clears throat> for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Amen. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Notice, if you would, the first phrase in verse 7. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. If you would, jump down with me to verse 10. The Bible says, And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Notice again verse 12. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according to as his work shall be. Come down one more time to verse 20. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. I'm going to stop reading there this evening, and for the next few minutes I'm going to preach on this subject. Ready or not, here I come. Ready or not, here I come. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together in your house, Lord, we just pray. Lord, that for the next little bit, Lord, that I would, Lord, that you would hide me behind the cross, Lord, and that I would do nothing for the next little bit but magnify the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Lord, that if there's one amongst us 
this evening that has never known the pardon and remission of sin, Lord, that have never trusted Christ as their personal Savior, Lord, that tonight would be the night that they would make that decision. Lord, this is a salvation message, but Lord, there is a challenge, and I pray tonight for every person tonight that claims the name of Jesus Christ. I pray for every born-again believer, Lord, that we have a responsibility. Lord, I pray that it would not only be a call to the lost, but it would be a challenge to the saved tonight. And I pray, Lord, that no matter who is here, that you would use your word tonight. Use my lips, my lips of clay, Lord, to be a blessing and a help to your church and to maybe someone here who is lost. Lord, we'll be sure to thank you and give you all the praise for what you accomplished. Lord, fill me now with your Holy Spirit, I pray. Help me tonight as I preach. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. And amen. Amen. Six times in the last book of your Bible, the Lord Jesus Christ tells us that he is coming quickly. Now, when a preacher today says something like that, much, much of our world today, and unfortunately, even some of our church folks today, will say, well now, preacher, it's been 2,000 years now since the Apostle John penned these words, and Christ hasn't shown up yet. And they'll say, evidently, it's not too quick. But the simple truth of the matter is this morning that the God of heaven does not run on our time clock. Amen. As Brother Wesley alluded, his timing is not our timing. His ways are not our ways. His will is not our will. Uh, but the simple truth of the matter is this evening is that the God of, the, of heaven a couple of weeks ago did not have to move his clock forward in order to keep things straight. Uh, he's not restricted by the world clock or our alarm clocks. Uh, and, and matter of fact, the Apostle Peter tells us over in 2 Peter chapter 3, that in the last days he warns us that there will be scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For yeah. since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue uh, continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Peter says, listen, there will be folks in your day that come and say, well, listen, he promised he was coming, but he's not come yet. But I want you to notice it, if you will, if you, were, if you can think back to it. He goes on to say in verse 8, he says, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as a day. Now, in my, in my finite, simple mind, here's how I interpret that. Here's how I understand that. The earth is about 6,000 years old, but according to that verse, it's only been six days since God created it. If, it's only, if a day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day, since Jesus Christ ascended back to heaven, it's only been a couple of days. And what Peter here is saying is, listen, it may be thousands of years for you, but it's only been a couple of minutes to God. Amen. He says, don't, don't, don't get caught up in all this nonsense of saying, well, he's, he's not coming if he's not come yet. Can I tell you? He's coming. Amen. He's coming, all right? And it, it, we can't be so confused. We can't be so drawn in by the world and by even religious people today that say, you know what? He's forgotten about us. I'm here today to tell you he's not forgotten about Amen. us. And he is indeed coming back. You see, as far as God is concerned, no matter what the scoffers say, no matter what the doubters say, it does not change the fact that what Christ said is true, and that is, He is coming back. You know, as I read through church history, I love to read through church history. I love our heritage. That's one thing that I'm not willing to let go of, is our Christian heritage. Uh, but as I read back through church history and through the early years of our country, I find that whenever and wherever a heaven-sent Holy Ghost revival broke out, time and time again there were two subjects that were always preached on. Those subjects, number one, the reality of a literal burning hell. Amen. And the second is the imminent return of Jesus Christ. Amen. And can I say this evening that it seems like the farther we have come along and the farther down the stream of time we go and the closer we get to our Lord's coming, it seems like that those two subjects are two subjects that you rarely hear preached on anymore. Uh, it seems like it's a strange thing for a man of God to stand up and filled with Holy Spirit power and boldness to get up with a tear in his eye and look at a congregation and tell them that there is a real place called hell that will accept any unbelieving sinner that has rejected Amen. Jesus Christ. I'm here today to tell you that the, that the rich man in Luke chapter 16, it's not a parable, it's not a fable. There really was a rich man. And he died and he went to a place called hell. And as real as I'm standing here, he's in hell this evening burning alive. No 
the fire has extinguished, it's not gone away, and it's not going to go away. And I'm telling you, when we get a hold of that, and when we start preaching that again, with a tear in our eye, not with damnation in our voice, but with a tear in our eye, warning people, we'll start to see people saved once again. And the other subject that we find is that the imminent return, in other words, that Jesus Christ could come at any moment and rapture his church out. And it, uh, it seems like we've almost become squeamish today. Uh, until here recently, it seems like we've become squeamish about telling men and women, boys and girls, that just any day now, the skies could part, the trumpet of God might sound, and the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, will step out onto the clouds and call his bride home. Amen. Jesus is coming. I'm reminded of the story. I love this story. It's a, it was a story of a young preacher. He took his first church, <clears throat> and he was preaching one of his first messages. And he was preaching on this subject, the imminent return of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, he was preaching on this passage of Scripture. And while he was preaching, he thought, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drive my point home. And I'm going I'm to reiterate this phrase over and over again to get my folks to realize that Jesus is coming. And he would get to the end of that platform and it sat a little bit higher than this platform, and the and the row was the first row of pews was just right there. He'd get on the edge of that platform, and he would shout, "Surely I come quickly!" And he preached that that first time, and nobody, everybody just sat there. Nobody moved. Nobody budged. There wasn't so much as a holy grunt. And he said, you know what? I'm going I'm to keep preaching. And here a second time, I'm going to emphasize the point again. And he got to the edge of that platform and he said, surely I come quickly. And they just sat there and just stared at him. All right, now, now if you know preachers very well, we like to get a stout amen every now and then. We like folks to know they're listening to us, all right? Uh, you start preaching on food, and people all of a sudden wake up, all right? But I tell you, he got to that platform the third time. He said, I'm just going to give it one more time. And he got right to the edge, and he said, Surely I come quickly! And he shouted that one last time, and he tripped and fell off the platform and landed into the lap of a dear old lady, 80 years old, been attending church there almost her entire life. And he got up and he straightened his jacket. He picked his Bible up and her glasses were all cockeyed and sideways. And he got up and he just apologized. He said, Sister, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. And to his amazement, she looked up at him and she said, Son, it's all right. She said, You done told me three times you were coming before you headed this away. It's my fault for not listening to you. Hey, can I tell you tonight, folks, over and over and over and over and over again, God tells us, my son's coming. My son's coming. You better look. You better watch. And I'm telling you, one of these days, Jesus is coming. And I'm afraid that he's going to catch a lot of church folks not watching. I'm afraid he's going to catch this world by surprise. But more importantly, I'm afraid he's going to catch a lot of God's people not paying attention. And he's going to look at them and say, I told you I was coming. It's your fault for not watching. I'll tell you tonight, folks, as a way of introduction... <laughs> Let me say that there are three ways by which we know Jesus is coming quickly. Number one, let me hasten. First of all, we know Jesus is coming quickly because of the state of our churches today. Amen. We'll not take time to turn there, but Paul wrote to Timothy and he tells him in 1 Timothy chapter 4 that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their consciences seared with a hot iron. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, he tells Timothy that the time will come when they, in other words, the time will come, Timothy, when the people you're preaching to will not endure sound doctrine. They will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and shall turn their ears away from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. He said, Timothy, the time's going to come when you stand up and preach a King James Bible, and they're not going to want that anymore. The time's going to come when, they're, when you're going to get them sound doctrine, when you're going to tell them about the blood atonement, when you're going to tell them about the resurrection, when you're going to tell them about the imminent return of Christ, basically anything found in the Word of God, and they're not going to want to hear that anymore. Yeah. Right, right. And then John, he gets over in Revelation chapter 3, and he describes the Laodicean church. He says they're neither hot nor cold. God wishes they were one or the other, but instead they're lukewarm. And you read it, folks, it makes God sick. 
It makes God sick. He said, I'll spew you out of my mouth for being so lukewarm. And they were so puffed up with pride. They'd lost their dependency on God. And he says, you think that you're rich and increased with good. You think you're well clothed. You think you see it far off. But he says, I tell you the truth. You're wretched and naked and poor and blind. And at the end of it, you read that Jesus, he's not in the church. He's standing on the outside wanting to let back in. And I'm telling you folks today, I don't mean to rag. I, don't, I want to get past this point, but I'm telling you, it concerns me today what goes on in the average church in America. It concerns me because the preacher, the man of God has been replaced by a puppet on a string. The Word of God, the preaching, the preaching of the Word of God has been replaced by story time and by pats on the back and daily devotionals and, 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 uh, and it's been replaced by, by feel-good messages. In other words, you just come and I'll make you feel good for coming to church. What we need is preaching. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. I'm telling you, we have replaced the old blood stain. Thank you. Thank you for singing these songs because I'm telling you, what is going on in our average churches today with this contemporary garbage makes me sick. They take the blood out of the songs and I tell you, it's nothing more than, than direct and air traffic in most, in, in most churches today. I'm telling you, why do we know Jesus is coming? Because of the state of our churches. Number two, we know that Jesus is coming quickly because of the signs of the times. Now you go and you read Matthew 24 and Luke 21. Jesus describes wars and rumors of wars. Great earthquakes in diverse places. Famines. Pestilences. And folks, you and I have been watching these very things transpire in our world in recent years. And Jesus said when these things begin to come to pass, lift up your head, look up to heaven, for your redemption draweth nigh. He told, he told us that in the days of Noah, they were eating and drinking and giving in marriage, and they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. They didn't know. People were just... People were just living about their lives. They weren't giving thought to Noah's message. They weren't giving the thought that one day they're going to die. One of these days the judgment of God is coming. And just as it was in Noah's day, so it is in our world today. Just as there was this lackadaisical, carefree disregard for the Word of God and the man of God in Noah's day, so it is in the day in which we live. But then also, not only do we know Jesus is coming quickly because of the state of our churches and because of the signs of the time, but thirdly, we simply know Jesus is coming because the Scriptures say so. Uh, uh. The Scriptures say so. The truth is, if we never saw one backslidden church, if we never saw one sign of the times, you and I tonight can know that Jesus is coming because He said He was coming. Amen. He said He was coming. Right. All right? Uh, Jesus, when He ascended back into heaven, the angel stood there and said, You men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus. I love it. He's not sending a cab. He's not sending an Uber. The same Jesus that died on the cross of Calvary one day is coming back for you and me. Amen. He's coming back. This same Jesus. I like, I like what He told... Um, I like what he told in Mark 13. He says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, know not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. He said, Take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when that time is. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And notice this, And what I say unto you, in other words, boys, what I'm saying unto you, I say unto all, Watch. You know what that means? That means if it was good enough for the apostles to watch for His coming, we ought to be watching it as well. You know, it's been 2,000 years. If He was close then, how much closer must we be today? Alright? So He said He was coming. You say, preacher, how do you know? He told me so. I read it in His Word. And you think about it, folks. Everything that the Lord Jesus has ever done, He has done on time. He has done on time. Uh, Isaiah, he prophesied of how a virgin would conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And then in Galatians, Paul writes that when the fullness of the time was come, God sent His only begotten Son, sent forth His Son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. So you see, Jesus came on time. But then not only that, the Lord Jesus died on time. Amen. You realize how many times the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin and the religious crowd tried to kill Jesus? But he says, you know what? No man takes my life. I lay it down. And he Amen. said, you know what? I'm 
going to die when it's my time Amen. to die. He says, you're not going to kill me. I'm just going to give up my life. Uh, all right? So not only did he come on time, not only did he die on time, but hallelujah, praise God, he rose again on time. He said, boys, I tell you what, you're going to put my body in the ground, but I'm only staying there three days. After three days, I'm getting back up. Can I tell you something tonight, folks? He came on time. He died on time. He rose again on time. It only stands the reason that he's coming back on time. Uh, I think there's a lot of people today that are hanging their heads saying Jesus has forgotten about us. I'm here today to tell you he's not. He's uh, coming back when it's his time to come back. Yeah, and the point of the message this evening is it could be tonight. Uh, it could be tonight. Now, folks, I tell you, the more, the more, the longer that I live and the more people that I'm around, the more churches that I go to, the more Christians that I meet, I find that I'm one of the few that still believe that Jesus could come back tonight. Uh, I feel like I'm in a good crowd tonight, but I'm just foolish enough to believe. I ain't got a whole lot of faith, but I've got just enough faith to believe that the trumpet could sound tonight. Uh, that there is nothing preventing the Lord Jesus Christ from coming back Amen. and rapturing us home. Now, I don't know about the rest of y'all, but I'm ready to go anytime he's ready. Amen. I tell you, heaven's looking better by the day. I tell you, it's looking better by the day. The more I deal with my flesh and the more that I'm in the world, the more wicked this world becomes, the sweeter heaven looks. And I'm ready if he's ready, if he's ready to come tonight. Now, to the message, and I'm going to hasten here. I don't want to be here all night, all right? Can I say this evening, knowing that he is coming back, there are a couple things that you and I need to have this evening. You need to have them this evening. First of all, Number one, you need to have a hiding place. You need to have a hiding place. Let me explain what I mean. I dare say that all of us, when we were children, we played the game hide and seek. Hide and seek. How many, how many of you are normal and have ever played hide and seek? All right, all of us have. All right, now you remember, you, someone would count, and inevitably, you'd get in a group of kids with a cheater. And what they would do is, that kid would count, and they'd either peek, while they're counting, or they go, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and they do that. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Amen. I see Amen. conviction sitting there on some of y'all. Some of y'all were cheaters, all right? But can I tell you, that counter, he had to hide his face. He was counting down to when he would come. And the rest of our job was to go and find a suitable hiding place. You were to hide. You were to find some place that could keep you concealed. Are you with me? Uh -huh. And now, inevitably, you've always played with that kid, and he was he was a few fries short of a Happy Meal. And he would always, he would kind of duck, and he would dodge, and he would find a little sapling that was no bigger than this, and he'd just kind of hide behind that sapling. <laughs> or he'd just freeze in place, hoping no one would see. Can I tell you, there would always be that one, listen to me now, that would try to find a hiding place, but would fail, and it would leave them out in the open. Uh -huh. It would leave them, can I say it this way, exposed. It would leave them exposed. Can I say this evening that there are scores of people all across this nation and all across this world maybe even sitting here tonight that are hiding behind something to try to merit their way to heaven. Can I say it this way? There are some and they're hiding behind baptism in order to get them to heaven. There, there, are, there are some this evening that are hiding behind church membership to try to get them to heaven. Can I tell you, there are scores of people who are trying to work their way to heaven. Oh, I'm a good person. I'm a good neighbor. I've never really done anything bad. I'm just trying to make it to heaven. They are hiding behind working. They are trying to hide behind all of these things in order to try to merit their way to heaven. But can I tell you this evening, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And folks, they'll run to works, they'll run to religion, they'll run to this and they'll run to that. But I'm here this evening to tell you that unless you are hid in Jesus Christ alone, Amen. you'll die and go to a devil's hell. Amen. You'll Amen. die and go to a devil's hell. If you would, turn with me back to Colossians. Colossians chapter 3. Hold your place here in Revelation 22. And come back to Colossians chapter 3. If you would, let me explain what I mean. I'm going to show you that the Bible says that Christ is our hiding place. Christ is our hiding place. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Paul is writing to the church at Colossae, and he's instructing them on how to live now that they're saved. And primarily, he's writing about the new life. You realize that once you got saved, you have the old man that has been crucified, but now you have a new man. 
Amen. You have a new life in Jesus Christ. And that's what he's writing about here in chapter Amen. 3. And in Colossians chapter 3, look please at verse 1. Chapter 3 and verse 1, the Bible says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Listen to this now. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with Him in glory. Can I tell you, folks, as 21 years ago, as a 10-year-old boy, I bowed my head and received Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. And when I did, my old life died. My old life died, but then I gained a new life in Jesus Christ. Amen. Paul said in Galatians 2.25, 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Not, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. You hear me, dear friend, the moment that I put my faith in Jesus Christ, God robed me in the righteousness of His own Son. I tell you what, I had myself a time last Sunday. I was preaching on how when, when Jesus Christ died for me, He bore all of my unrighteousness in His own body. And can I tell you, the moment that I trusted Him as my Savior, God put all of His righteousness on my account. Amen. God, God, I tell you, the night when God looks at me, He no longer sees Stuart Fitzwater, but He sees the righteousness of His only begotten Son. When God looks at me, you hear me tonight, I'm excited about it. When He looks at me, I'm hid in Christ. When He looks at me, He sees someone who is just as perfect as His only Son. Can I tell you, now that doesn't mean I'm perfect. That doesn't mean I sin. But in God's eyes, He no longer sees my unrighteousness but he sees all of Christ's righteousness. Amen. That's what it means to be hid in Jesus Christ. Can I tell you, folks, There are. I'm telling you, God's counting down. God's counting down. And you tell you, he's the only one who's counting. He's the only one who knows how much time is left. And people are running all over this world and all over this country trying to find something to hide behind in order to get themselves to heaven. Can I submit to you the church of Jesus Christ by the birth of the uh, by the new birth? We know what it takes. We know how to be born again. We know where our hiding place is and it's our responsibility to lead those people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. They're hiding behind their religion. They're hiding behind their works. They're hiding behind anything and everything except Jesus Christ. He is the only way to heaven. Amen. Amen. Now, can I tell you something, folks? This is, this, is, this is scary to me. Every child of God can claim that promise tonight. That's not what scares me. I want you to go back to Revelation 6. Revelation 6. I want, I want to show you this. And you, most of us know this, but I want you to turn back here. Revelation chapter 6. This chapter describes for us the seal judgment. I'm not going to get into, I'm not going to get in, into prophecy here this evening. I'm just going to give you a little taste. Can I tell you, what I'm getting ready to describe, I'm glad I'm not going to be here for. Amen. I'm not, there's, there's something coming called the tribulational period. And you hear me, according to that book, I'm not going to have to spend a minute in it. Uh -huh. And for that, I'm thankful. Yeah. So, but Amen. let me show you what every person will have to endure that does not trust Christ as their Savior and has to live during this period. Paul, or excuse me, John, he describes something called seal judgments that will happen during the tribulational period. And at this point, the church will have already been raptured to heaven, and it will be a time where God's wrath is poured out. It describes some events. The Bible says that the sun will be blackened. You know, we're supposed to have this solar eclipse in like two weeks. Can I tell you, folks will be standing around looking at that, but when God blackens the sun, Son. There isn't anybody going to be standing around ogling what God's doing. They're going to be hiding. They're going to be running. Let me show you what I mean. Look please, if you will, at verse 15. The Bible says, And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man. Hey, that's anybody. That's anybody and everybody. It doesn't matter your social status, the greatest to the least. All of them, look at what they're going to be doing. Hit themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of Him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of God. Folks, I cannot overestimate, over-exaggerate, overstate the seriousness of what I'm about to say. But according to the Word of God, 
every single lost person has one of two choices. They can either be saved now, prior to the rapture and prior to their death, their life being hid with Christ, or they can spurn the invitation, they can reject Jesus Christ as their Savior, and should they be so as unfortunate to face the tribulation period, listen to me now, they will not be hid with Christ, but they will hide from Christ. Do you, you understand me this evening? What a privilege it is to be hid with Christ. To be hid with Christ is to find the grace of God. But to hide from Christ one day, I'm telling you folks, He can either be your brother or your enemy. He can either be your Savior or your enemy. Can I tell you, I'd much rather have Him as my Savior tonight. I'd much rather be hid with Christ knowing that He's my brother, knowing that I'm a joint heir with Christ, knowing that I'm a son of God, than as to that has to live through something called the tribulation period and one day hide from the very one that was meant to be my Savior. Amen. Can I tell you tonight, folks? Can I say it's well worth you getting saved? Can I say this? And I don't say it nearly enough. It's, just, it's worth you just getting saved just to escape the tribulation period. Amen. It's just, I mean, it's worth you just getting saved for that. But can I tell you, there's something far worse Amen. than the tribulation period. You see, the tribulation period doesn't end all. There's a place called the lake of fire. And it burns with fire and brimstone forever. You see, while all of us are saved and in heaven for eternity, there will be those that will suffer for all eternity. Never ending. They're not going to perish. They're not going to burn up. Their soul's not going to be asleep. They will feel everything for all eternity. That's why you need Christ as your Savior. Because He can save you from that. So number one, we need to be hid with Christ. We need a hiding place. Number two, we need to have a happy position. A happy position. You say, preacher, I'm saved this evening. I'm going to talk to saved people for just a moment. You say, preacher, I'm saved this evening. I know that I'm saved and I'm on my way to heaven. Isn't that all I need? Can I, can I say to you this evening that you have all you need to go to heaven if you know Christ as your Savior. But let me ask you, how do you feel tonight about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ? What is your attitude towards His return? Returning. If you go back to Revelation 22, look at the last phrase in verse 20. John says, even so come, Lord Jesus. Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, even so, wait a little while. You notice that. He doesn't say... He, he, he doesn't say, um, uh, well, hang on, Lord, I've got a few things that I need to get right. No, he says, even so, come right now. John was ready for Jesus to come. Can I, can I challenge you a little bit this evening, child of God? Are you ready for Him to come if He were to come right now? Amen. Are you ready for Him to come if He were to come right now? Oh, you're saved. Listen, if you're saved, you're going back with Him. But are you satisfied with how you lived Monday through Friday this past week? That's a lot of things we don't stop and consider. And I'm just as guilty. But if this was the last week of your life, are you good with that? Can you honestly stand before Him? By the way, you will stand before Him. You're not going to stand before a proxy. You're not going to stand before Peter, Paul, or John. You're going to stand before the very Savior that died for you. Let me ask you, how did you live this last week? If he come back right now and you had no other opportunity to repent of unrepentant sin, I'm talking about daily sin. If you had someone that you needed to witness to but never had the opportunity, never got another opportunity, God gave you an opportunity this week but you spurned it. Are you good with that? I'm not trying to be unkind, but dear friend, if we truly believe that Jesus could come back tonight, we best be considering some things. We best stop and think about how I lived yesterday. If Jesus is coming back in the morning, how's it going to affect my night tonight? If I believe that He could come back tonight, how am I going to live until He gets here? Let me ask you tonight, child of God, if He came right back, if he came back right now, is everything right between you and Him? Or is there sin? Yes, hear me now, child of God, is there sin in your life? You know, to a lot of Christians today, you mention that word sin, and they think, well, I'm not a sinner anymore. I got news for you. You don't know the book. Listen, you may be, you, you may, your old man may be crucified, but he doesn't stay dead often. 
Can I tell you, your old flesh rises up. The Bible says, John tells us in John 1.19, 1 John 1.19, that if we confess our sins, in other words, he's talking to the Christians. In other words, i got news for you, child of God. You still sin. Amen. And let me ask you, are you all caught up? Have you kept a short account with God or have you been going all week? How's your prayer life been? Let me ask you, how's your Bible reading been? Let me ask you, how's your testimony been? Can I, can I, and I'm just talking, listen, I'm talking as much to me as I am anybody else. I, I'm just a sinner saved by grace just as anybody else. But I'm telling you, if we truly believe Jesus is coming back, it will cause our behavior to act accordingly. Amen. You see, our beliefs dictate our behavior. You see, I don't think that there's anybody in this room that believes that this church is on fire. Because if you did, we'd be running out the door. Are you with me? All right. Now you say, Jesus, I know He's coming back and He could come back. Are you acting like it? Are you living like it? All right. Are you living like it? If that trumpet were to sound right now, would there be part of your heart that would think, oh, no, 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 no. I can't have Him coming back right now. I'm a little hesitant for Him to come back. Or would you be able to say with, with, as clear as you could, I know that I'm not perfect but I know that I've done my best this week to live for Him. I, I believe that He'd be pleased with how I live my life this week. You say, preacher, that's not possible. I mean, for, for a child of God not to want Christ to come back, that's not possible. I submit to you that John writes in 1 John chapter 2, he says, Now little children, abide in Him, that when He shall appear, we may have confidence, get this now, and not be ashamed before Him at His coming. Can I remind you of something very real? If it's necessary for John to write those words, there will be Christians who are ashamed when Jesus comes back. In other words, they've not been living like they're supposed to be living. And Jesus is going to catch them off guard. And they're going to be ashamed. I tell you, God is my witness. I don't want to be ashamed when He comes back. That's why I need to be right tonight. That's why I need to be right tonight. All right? I, I was thinking back to my teenage years. I'm, I'm almost done. I was thinking back to my teenage years. You know, there would be times when mom and dad would go somewhere for a, a, for the day or even even overnight, and they'd leave Jared and I. Jared, Jared's my younger brother, and he and I were only separated by three years. I had someone this week think that I was Jared's father. <laughs> a preacher, of all people, called my brother and said, I, well, I want to send something to, to, to your mom who's a pastor's wife. And he said, Mom's not a pastor's wife. And he said, Well, Stuart's your dad, right? And I thought, What in the world? And obviously, they've never seen me. And they even went so far to say, Well, he is your much older brother than isn't he? And he said, No, we're only separated by three years. Now, folks, I feel old, all right? I feel old now, all right? But, anyways, my mom and, I, my, my, my mom and dad would leave Jared and I. And here's what they do Mom and dad, they'd leave. They'd leave for the day or they'd leave for two days. And they'd be like, all right, boys, here's what, here's what we need done. And they'd leave us a list to do while they were gone. Now, here's what was good about mom and dad. Mom and dad would say, all right, it's 8 o'clock. We're leaving the house now. We'll be back at 4. Now, inevitably, and you ask Jared, if he's telling the truth, he'll, he'll be honest with you. This is what we did. We'd wait until 3 to do the list of things. Can I, can I get a witness? Any, anybody else? You know what we do? We put off doing what we were supposed to do. Because, listen to me now, because we knew when mom and dad would be back. Yeah. Amen. Now here's what would sometimes happen. They'd get off work a little early or they'd get back and they'd not tell us when they were coming back. And they'd get home and we'd be sitting on our hands, we'd be doing something. And you know what? The list that we had been left to do wouldn't be done. And you know what we'd have to do? We'd have to stand ashamed. This is, this is, this is Stuart Fitzwater theology. If you don't want to buy into this, you don't have to buy into this. But you want to know one of the reasons why the Lord hasn't told us when He's coming back? This is just me. You want to know why I think God hasn't told us when He's coming back? Because He knew that if He did tell us when He was coming back, we'd put off living the Christian life until right before He gets here. You say, can I just give you, for instance, let's say the Lord were to give us one more revelation and say, all right, church, He tell every saved individual, all right, church, here's what I'm going to do. Next Sunday, not tomorrow, but next Sunday at noon, I'm coming back. You know what we do? From this moment till next Sunday, we would live the best Christian life we possibly could. Wouldn't we? That's right. 
Right. We keep our noses clean. We read our Bibles. We'd be on fire praying and doing the things of God. If we had lost ones in our life, we'd be witnessing to them. Guess what? We'd be in church tomorrow morning. Amen. Guess what? We'd be in church Wednesday night. <coughs> we'd be in church if there was something going on. Can I tell you what? We'd live the best Christian life we could if we knew when Jesus was coming back. But here's the thing. We don't know when He's coming back. Amen. Therefore... We ought to live like He's coming back every single day. You want to know how not to stand the shame? Live like He's coming back in five minutes. Live your life tomorrow. Live your life tomorrow like He's coming back. Can I tell you something tonight, folks? Live your life next week as if He's coming back. Alright? As if He's coming back. Can I tell you tonight, folks? We need to realize once again... We need to realize once again that Jesus Christ could come back. And I reiterate again that if we truly believe that, it will re be reflected in our life. It will be reflected in our life. You say, preacher, can I be honest with you this morning? This is, my, again, my personal opinion. But it may be this evening that many Christians don't serve the Lord the way they ought to because they don't fear the Lord the way they ought to. Amen. You, you say, preacher, no child of God should ever have to fear the Lord. You don't know the book. You don't, you don't know the book. Last I, checked, last I checked, Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes that the whole duty of man is to fear God Amen. and keep His commandments. Amen. Can I tell you, as a child of God, I no longer live in fear that I'm going to die and go to hell. But I tell you what I do live in fear of, the chastisement of God. How many of you ever got a weapon? Amen. Yeah, I tell you what, there's one greater than mom and dad, and he knows better how to give a weapon than even mom and dad knows how. And I tell you, he knows where to put his finger and make it hurt. You say God's cruel. God wants you right with Him, and He will do what's necessary to cause you to be right with Him. Amen. Can I tell you, there are some days, forgive me, there are some days, forgive me, there are some days when I just don't love the Lord like I ought to. But you know what? On those days, what keeps me in line is a healthy fear of God. Amen. We need more today in our churches, more than this reverential awe. We need, oh yeah, He's God, He's great. Can I tell you, we need to fear God once Amen. again. We need to walk and say, you know what, if I step out of line, God can correct me to bring me back in line. I don't, I don't live in fear. I don't live in fear that God's going to abuse me. But I do live in fear that should I cross the line, God can do anything necessary to bring me back in line. Amen. We need, to, we need to get back to a fear of God. And then lastly, not only do we need to have, first of all, not only do we need to have a hiding place. Secondly, not only do we need to have a happy position, but thirdly, we need to have an honest profession. Now, I, I'm going to get real for you for just five minutes and then I'm done. But I'm going to ask every single person in this room one question. And I, I'm going to say up front, and I told my church this, I am not in the business i tell you who's in the business. The devil is in the business of getting people to doubt their salvation. Amen. I'm not. But I tell you what. It's a good thing every now and then for a man of God to come along and ask church members, are you saved? Because I just happen to believe that there are a whole lot of Baptists in hell tonight that have depended on their church membership to get them to heaven. Can I tell you, you're just as soon to go to hell sitting in a Baptist church as you are on a bar stool. Amen. Can I tell you, lost is lost no matter where you are. Amen. And I'm not, I don't want anybody in this room, if you're saved, you can have that assurance. But I'm here today to tell you that if you're trusting and you're sitting in your seat tonight to get you to heaven and that's it, you're lost and on your way to hell. But only, only if you have ever trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior do you know for sure that you're going to heaven? I want to ask everyone, listen, I don't need hands, I don't need yes, sir. You ask yourself, if you were to die right now, if God were to take your life, do you know for sure that you would go to heaven? If you can't say, preacher, I know, I want to give you a perfect opportunity so you can know. Amen. In, in just a few minutes, we're going to have a song of invitation. And Now, here, here's, here's the thing, and I, I have considered this, and I dare say many of you have considered this. You say, preacher, there are people that know me as a member of either this church or another church. People know that I'm a member of a church. Preacher, if I get up tonight 
and I come forward wanting to make my calling an election. Sure, if, 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 I, if I'm afraid that I'm lost and I want to get right with God and know that I'm saved, it's going to shock a whole lot of people. People are going to be like, oh, we thought he was saved. Well, she's, she, he or she was saved. Let me ask you a question. What would you rather do? Would you rather come forward tonight, get saved, or gain the assurance of your salvation and know you're going to heaven, maybe shock a few people, or would you rather go to hell having fooled everyone? Because I tell you what, you may fool me, but you're never going to fool God. Amen. He knows your heart. I can look at you and I might be able to guess. It's not in my place to guess. I can expect your life for fruit, but the truth is I don't know if you're saved or not. Only you can know that. But can I tell you tonight, if, there's a, if, there, is, if there is the slightest twinge of doubt in your mind, there isn't a soul in here, and if there is, there's some preachers in here who will have a talk with them. There isn't a soul in here that will look down their crooked nose at you for coming and getting your call in election short. You know what we'll do? We'll rejoice that you finally have the assurance of your salvation. Can, can I tell you, if you know you're lost in here tonight, the very best thing you can do is come and get saved. Because everything that I've talked about, about hell and the tribulation period, that's where you're headed. That's where you're headed without Jesus Christ. I'm going to say this and, I, and I'll close. I'll, I'll say this and I'm done. I stood, it's been, it's been a little over five months now, and I stood in the little narrow hallway at United Hospital Center. And I was dressed in scrubs head to toe. They had me covered. I was looking, I was looking uglier in sin. Just everything just covered in, 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 in hospital garb. And my wife, my dear wife, was sitting in the, in the delivery room, in, in, the, in the operating room where she was going to have her C-section. And they came and they said, Mr. Fitzwater, are you ready? And I said, yeah, as ready as I'll ever be. And they took me back and they, they had a sheet. Any of, your, any of your wives have ever had a C-section, you know what that sheet's there for. They offered to let me look, but I, I, I'm a, I got a weak stomach and, and a weak constitution, and I'd pass out, so I said, I ain't looking. So I sat down at the head of my wife, where my wife's head was right here, and I sat down. And we sat there and we prayed, but you know what we did? We listened. You know what we were waiting on? We were waiting on sound. Can I tell you that sound signaled the arrival of someone that we've been waiting for. Uh -huh. And can I tell you tonight, it was so good to hear my daughter cry for the first time. Because you know what? When we heard that cry, we knew that she had arrived. Uh -huh. But you hear me tonight as a child of God, I'm listening for another sound. I'm listening for the trump of God tonight. I'm listening for that trumpet to sound to, to, to announce the arrival of somebody else. And I don't know about anybody else in this room. I can only speak for Stuart Fitzwater. But I'm ready tonight to hear that sound. Uh, I, I, I'm ready. You say, are, are you hoping it's tonight? Yes, but I am prepared to hear that sound. Can I tell you who's not prepared? Anybody outside of Jesus Christ. Because I'm telling you, that trumpet will sound one day. And if you are not prepared Amen. for that, or if you're not prepared to die, Amen. you need to trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. The Bible says, even so come, Lord Jesus. Now listen, you, you don't have to take my word for it. You can, you can take the Holy Word of God toward for it. Jesus Christ is coming back. Amen. Amen. And I tell you tonight, upon the authority of the Word of God, it could be the season. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask if our piano player would come and Sister Dixie would come. And while we stand for an invitation tonight, I'm not going to say lost, or, I'm just going to say this. If you need to know tonight, that you're saved. If you need to know tonight that heaven is your home, I want to invite you to get up out of your seat. Come. You're not coming to me. I'm not asking you to join a church. I'm not even asking you to get baptized. I'm asking you tonight. If you die, do you know for sure? Do you know for sure you go to heaven? And if you can't say, yes, preacher, I know I'm going to heaven, I want to invite you to walk down this aisle and come and get saved tonight. While we sing. 107? 107. While we sing tonight, is there one?
Amen. Amen.